Hi, everyone. Happy Friday to you all. I'm your host, Corey Camp, and this is the Sydney Coach Replay Show. I'm super excited today, y'all, kind of ganging out just a little bit. We have on uh, our special featured guest today is Catlin Tucker. If you have bought any books around blended learning or you've been looking for resources, there's a chance one of those books or one of those resources has come from Dr. Catlin Tucker. She's a best-selling author, international trainer, keynote speaker, was named Teacher of the Year back in 2010 in Sonoma County, where she taught for 16 years. She earned her doctorate in learning technologies uh, at Pepperdine University and is currently working as a blended learning coach in an and an education consultant. She's written a series of best-selling books on blended learning, including Balance with Blended Learning, Blended Learning in Action, which was my first book that I ever bought, <laughs> um, Power Up Blended Learning, and Blended Learning in Grades 4 through 12. She's active on Twitter. You can see her Twitter handle right there on her video feed and writes an internationally ranked blog at CatlinTucker.com. So welcome. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm super excited. And 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 I reached out to you. There's so many things that I think that you have created valuable resources around, especially as we've moved into both throughout emergency online teaching in the spring. I turned into tuned into your blog a lot for some great resources. But then also as we've kind of settled into this, you know, current normal, the new normal, whatever you want to call it for um, teaching and learning. And we're still doing remote instruction, but with more intentionality and a little bit more focus. We also have in-person instruction, but it's socially distanced. And in some classrooms, we're doing a combination of that. And so I asked you to come on today to talk with us specifically about the um, concurrent hybrid model where teachers are teaching a group of students in their classroom, socially distanced, as at the same time, streaming in a set of students remotely from home. So, and this is, I think, the most complex of the structures that there are when we think a little bit about um, instructional uh, ways that we could do this in our classrooms. And uh, I know that it's probably not the most ideal. Do you want to talk a little bit about the concurrent hybrid model? Yeah. So I, I've i been writing a few blogs to try to support teachers who are faced with the concurrent classroom, which is what I've been talking about when I talk mm -hmm. about teachers who have kids in class and then they have kids joining remotely. And I feel torn about it because it's not a best practice. I think it's the most challenging position that we can put teachers in in this moment. You know, I I think there are a lot of aspects of the concurrent classroom that concern me. And yet, you know, teachers, a lot of them don't have a choice. They're just in this situation. This is what you have to do. And so how do we navigate this situation in a way that allows us to do, still make meaningful connections with kids and hopefully still leverage the affordances associated with in class face to face learning because there are some real benefits to that obviously but then mm -hmm. also the affordances of online learning and i think online learning has been a bit vilified because this whole transition was so unexpected teachers didn't feel prepared for it and right. so it's been really hard and i totally understand that but there are advantages to that type of learning as well and i i worry that without some intentionality around training and designing and facilitating that, you know, teachers are feeling so swamped that they're, they're kind of um, reverting back to some of that, okay, I'm going to lean on direct instruction and practice. And, you know, that's all I feel like I really can do when I'm torn between teaching kids in one learning landscape, while also being responsible for engaging kids in a totally different learning landscape. Yeah, I love that you call them landscapes. I, I refer to them as dimensions um, in, when I talk with teachers, right? You've got your your virtual dimension and your pers in person or your analog dimension, and thinking a little bit through through those and and really how we engage. And and this is kind of taking two ends of the spectrum and not really mashing them up, but kind of laying them on top of each other. It's, it's, it really isn't ideal, but it is, like you said, the situation that a lot of our schools are in to, you know, whether it's because of staff or devices or however they're moving forward. So 
I know you've got some tips um, and some really great strategies for if this is the model that we have, how can we go about in doing this in the in keeping some of the best practices as we move forward? Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I remember writing my first blog on this where it took me a couple of weeks. Like, how do I wrap my like, how do I wrap my head around this so that I can help teachers to figure out how do we approach this moment and be as successful as possible? And I really, you know, obviously my area of expertise is blended learning. I am a huge fan of using those models to shift control to learners, to mm -hmm. create opportunities for differentiated and personalized learning, um, giving students more agency. And so as I imagined, gosh, if I'm in a classroom and I'm juggling kids in these two spaces, then my instinct is to lean on those models, right? I I'm not gonna try to have myself at the front of the room guiding a, a whole group lesson with kids in these two spaces. Instead, mm -hmm. how do I structure the lesson so I still get a chance to connect with smaller groups of students at a time, um, allow for some communication and collaboration among kids in the class. Um, and so kind of thinking about how we leverage these blended learning models to get that done. So, you know, for example, I've had a lot of teachers since spring who love the station rotation model. They used it all the time. And then we went online. And so I was like helping them to understand here's a virtual example of right. rotation where mm -hmm. you can still meet with small groups and you can still differentiate that, you know, that instruction and that practice and the scaffolds. And when I think about the concurrent classroom, I see that is still being wildly beneficial, right? Even if teachers have, you know, two groups of in-class students and one group of online students rotating through and dedicating 15, 20, 25 minutes, whatever they have for a class period with each of their groups, because one of the challenges around the concurrent classroom is really just inequality of teacher attention, right? If kids right. Can raise a hand or yell out, which we, <laughs> we know they do as soon as they hit a bump, then they're always going to command more of the teacher's attention, those kids who are in the physical space. And the kids online, it's it's much harder for them to command the teacher's attention. So by rotating through and spending dedicated amounts of time with each group, then each group does get that teacher's attention. And another thing that I've been kind of encouraging ed educators to think about is how do we create a single avenue for kids to ask questions, ask for support? So yes. whether that's using the Remind app and just training them, like if you have a question, here's where you ask it, or using a tool like Classroom Q, where you can create this kind of virtual queue where people add their names and their request or their question to this virtual queue. So regardless of whether I'm learning online or I'm learning in the classroom, we are all having this kind of opportunity to ask questions in the same way. So I wrote about the station rotation and then I talked about kind of the three part flip where I always, when I'm coaching teachers, I'm like, yes, we can use video. Video is awesome. It's like such a great strategy from freeing us. Like we have to be at the front of the room explaining stuff all the time or providing instruction directions. And so how do we build engagement around a video? Like what's going to happen leading into it? How are we going to exit them out of it? And maybe that lean in is a collaborative activity where groups of students are working together in person. And that doesn't mean we have to shove desks together, right? They can still right. have conversations. Um, we can bring them together in shared virtual spaces, whether they're online or in the classroom to kind of, you know, work together. So I think it's about trying to figure out how do we leverage these models to get out of that whole group scenario, which I think is just really hard. It's so, so challenging. I don't think whole group instruction is particularly effective. I, I worry that kids online just feel disconnected from the learning community. So how do we lean on these models to allow us to really make meaningful connections with students? You know, the playlist model, every kid can be progressing through a playlist with a path that can be personalized to some degree. And then the teacher just gets to focus on being that value add, right? Meeting with kids, pulling groups that need additional support or instruction. So that's been kind of my, my, my approach, but then I also know there's plenty of teachers who weren't using blended learning models before all this happened. So telling right. them to use a model to meet the demands of this situation isn't particularly helpful. 
Yeah, well, and, there, and you know, there's there's a certain art to doing station rotation well, especially once you start to get to know your students and you're starting to think differently about your the grouping of your students based off of your concept. But I think you can just very simply start with, let me split my, that example you gave where you've got maybe a third at home and two thirds in the classroom split them into thirds and have specific things. And that's how I got started with blended learning. So I use that in my classroom um, my last few years. And it started with some flipped videos, mm -hmm. which then freed me up from the front of the classroom yep. and holding everyone's attention at once to say, all right, now I can kind of move through. And I use them to, for directions to give directions to groups yep. so they could just push play and go right into it. And um, so I also see like the, the playlist especially, but even just starting with some, you know, pre-recording some of your content mm -hmm. and using that station rotation to kind of get closer to your online students. So at one point I might be at the at my desk or at the small group table alone with my computer, yep. talking to my students, checking in with them, seeing how they're doing. And then they go off and do some independent asynchronous while I work with another group where they're going through their playlist. So, mm -hmm. um, and I think everyone can go check out your, um, your blog, which we have uh, the link to, we'll put it here in the comments that we also have the link to that in our notes and takeaways for today. So y'all be sure to check that out and you can see some specific examples and structures of a playlist I was just sharing with a, with a teacher yesterday. I was telling Catlin just before the show um, how valuable that is just to see an example and a structure and begin to think a little bit through that. But yeah, and, and thinking about the idea of using a tool as a, a way to bring those two realms together. I, I like Nearpod or Pear Deck. I'm a Pear Deck fan. But if they're all able to respond and then I can share everybody's responses, they get to see that. Those are really valuable for making sure everyone still has a voice in the classroom, mm -hmm. even if they're at home. So I love, I love that. Um, all right. So then we do have, I know I've talked to, and you probably have as well, some schools around the country who they're doing this concurrent hybrid model, but due to a lack of resources or they're still waiting for resources to come in, so many devices are on back order. Mm -hmm. The students at home doing remote instruction are the ones who have the devices so they can connect to the classroom, but the students in the classroom have limited to no technology. It's all in the teacher's hand if there's any there. Um, so how does a teacher begin to navigate something like that? Because in that instance, you can't use um, a virtual platform for them to ask questions or be able to respond together. So what advice do you have for those classrooms? Well, I think, you know, it reminds me of really early on in my own blended learning journey. So I never worked in a one to one. And yet I was a big enthusiast of like, how do we engage kids with technology? How do we really like get them leaning into the learning using some of these tools? But for years, that that was me writing one donors choose project after another to get one Chromebook in my classroom, then two Chromebooks in my classroom. And so really my, my journey began focusing on that kind of maximizing that limited tech. And I think in some respects, we have to do that right now in those classrooms. I think the trickiest part is if kids are going to be using limited devices in the classroom, um, then there's an issue of like, how do we keep them clean? And how is it, you know, is there issues right. around device sharing? So, I mean, I think in this moment, you know, it's when planning for the concurrent classroom, it's almost like you have to plan an online lesson and then you have to modify for kids who are in the classroom. Right. And so how do we take what we're asking kids to do online and then make it work for this offline learning? And I mean, I guess the good news is we've been engaging kids in offline learning. I was just going to say that. Right. Yeah. So those yeah. strategies don't that those best practices that we've been leaning on for forever, we can still tap into those now. I think mm -hmm. it, we still just we don't want to slip into that trap of, OK, I'm just going to talk and they're going to write or I'm going to talk and they're going to practice 
because mm -hmm. we don't have technology. It's like they can still do all kinds of engaging things. They can still have agency in that classroom. So um, it's not ideal. I feel my heart goes out to those teachers who are yeah. like, you know, because it is it does feel in some respects like you are planning two entirely different lessons. If you have to figure out how to make this learning um, seamless in the online environment and then how to take it and adapt it so the kids in the classroom can do it without technology. But Right. You know, I, I hope that we can lean on things that have been successful before we had technology permeating classrooms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I, I too started with just a few devices in my classroom um, as well and, and was able to kind of do a station rotation in that way. And um, so I, I do think that that's some really good advice, right? To, to kind of plan a parallel lesson, but a low tech version versus a, a higher tech version. So then what do we, what do you think about our role as leaders and coaches? Those are most of our viewers are leaders and coaches. And how do we support a teacher who is working in this concurrent classroom? I mean, all of our teachers are stressed right now and if we develop de delicate within our, our coaching and support, right? We, we want to make sure that they feel supported and, but not feel that we are pull, pulling them in too many directions. What's the best way to support our teachers right now? I think what teachers need to hear from leaders right now is one, less is more. Like you're not gonna cover the volume of information and the the kind of amount of curriculum that you likely tried to cover pre-COVID. That's just, it's just not gonna happen. Um, I think there needs to just be an acknowledgement of that. And also kind of having leaders encourage teachers to try new things and let them know that failure is part of the learning process, right? Yes. Like it has to be okay for teachers to try stuff and have it totally bomb, right? That's right. that's just part of what it means to be a learner is to try, experiment, fail, learn, try again. And I think the more leaders kind of message that to teachers and teachers really feel that it's safe to try new things and, you know, whatever works, we'll try it again. And if it didn't, we'll reassess and we, we won't do that. We won't use that strategy again. But even for learners in this moment, right? Like, yes, everything's new for teachers, but it's new for learners. And, and if teachers start to model that kind of um, growth and, you know, they're, they're honest with kids about trying new things and like, hey, let's see how this goes. And if it doesn't go well, we'll We'll talk about it. We'll make improvements. And we'll try it again. And so I just think, you know, some leaders have been really good about this. Like they've mm -hmm. even, you know, some of the professional development for teachers has been like, okay, let's identify some like priority standards for our department, right? right? These are like the must do's, the things that are really important for kids to understand or be able to do before they leave a class. Um, and let's figure out how to frame our curriculum around that. I also think, you know, really kind of allow or encouraging teachers to kind of capitalize on that student curiosity and figure mm -hmm. out how are we making sure that learning in this moment is relevant and interesting for kids? Like how are we giving them some choice and voice to make sure that they're connecting with the curriculum in a meaningful way? Because I think, you know, they're, we're, we don't have them necessarily kind of it, trapped in a physical space. So we need to be really intentional about the things we're designing and asking kids to engage with because there's just a lot of learners who are, they're still being given just, you know, whether it's a digital worksheet or an endless kind of um, parade of Google Forms, it's just mm -hmm. it's a lot for them. And I think some of them are just feeling like they're jumping through hoops. So how do we make this really meaningful? And so that, those are things I just want leaders to be thinking about and and having conversations with teachers about. Yeah, and it, and it's really important. Some of the teachers I've I've been working with and some of the coaches I've been working with this past semester, um, they talk a lot about the failures. And sometimes you can kind of hear a little bit that those failures are not always seen in the best light, even mm -hmm. though they should be. Right? What do we learn from that? You know, trying to use that tool or it didn't quite work the way we thought it would, or we forgot to you know make it the copy version instead of the, the share the whole version. You know, those things happen, but we can learn from those. Um, and then well, and I, it just small No, time. I was just gonna, your comments make me think too, like not only is failing forward so important, but I think, I think why it's so hard for teachers to fail is because we put so much of our, or so much mm -hmm. of our value is wrapped mm -hmm. up in being like an expert, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, 
that's the piece that I also think leadership could be doing a lot to message around, which is um, shifting this idea that teacher ex the that teacher expertise is where our value lies. Mm -hmm. um, because quite frankly, if we our value is tied up in being the expert of like a particular subject area, right? Then right. technology is really threatening, right? Because like the computer knows way more than I do. <laughs> Google yeah. knows way more than I do. Yeah. But if we help teachers to really place the focus on their work connecting with kids and being mm -hmm. facilitators of learning and that human side, not the information side, the human side of learning, I think that could also just help teachers to kind of reevaluate their own value and, and mm -hmm. invest in those parts of their work that are so important to helping kids feel seen and supported in this moment. Yeah, and that's the, that's the thing that most teachers are are the most concerned of right now anyway. How do I connect with my students who I don't get to see every day and I don't get to hug and you know mm -hmm. all of those pieces. That's the part that that's kind of breaking our hearts the most as educators. How do I, you know, make sure that I see students who you know, it may not be a priority for them to show up on time to the Zoom meetings or into the classroom. So how do I connect with families and students? Um, but there's been so much that's come out of that that's great. But then, you know, that's constantly competing with the, as you mentioned, you know, we want to try to make sure that our pace and sequence is the same as it was in years past. And we have to let go of a little bit of that. I think it's also really important for us as leaders, especially our, our coaches, to really make sure that we're helping teachers uncover and reflect frequently as, as busy as they are, uncover that thinking and help them think through how the lesson sequence, the design of their lessons is fundamentally different because of these two different dimensions or the, mm -hmm. the use of technology as well. And, and sometimes just helping them pl plan, I think is a valuable support role especially from the coach perspective, like whenever mm -hmm. I can get into a co lesson planning session with the teacher. Um, absolutely. I think those are the most magical moments in them realizing like, oh, I can really focus on this. And here's a structure I can use to plan. And I think mm -hmm. for us as coaches, supporting that process. I mean, I know that coaches are so spread thin. It's so often right. that I'll work with coaches and they're like, I have 320 teachers <laughs> that I'm supporting. And I'm like, yeah. oh my gosh. Um, but really helping them to design for this moment, I think is a huge area where coaches can be so, so supportive and valuable. Yeah. yeah. And, and one of the things that I found valuable, especially during this kind of coaching virtually from a distance is um, having teachers kind of walk through what's what's the outcomes? What are what are your some of your plans? How are you thinking this to sequence this? We can go back and forth. But then once they've got that planned out and maybe once they've tried it and it's gone well, we're having that teacher record how they set it up and, and how their structure is and share that with other teachers. If I'm yes. coaching 300, like they need to hear and see from each other. And right now we're all hunkered down focusing on the little green light. And I think this will that would be a helpful way to kind of help teachers build on each other's skills and the things they're learning as they're, as they're going. So uh, Kelly Pittman is watching and she said, I love the idea of the human side of teaching. Absolutely. That's so, so valuable. And really where we, we, we have to start and we have to make sure that we continually address that um, with our students. So yeah, it's just so hard because teachers are asked to do so much like this, mm -hmm. this work is so multifaceted and you know, it's so easy to get really like, you know, wrapped up in all these details and all these to do things that we know we need to do. And, and then at the end of the day, we know like, oh, I didn't feel like I connected with those kids enough, yeah. you know? And so it's like, yeah. I think recentering a little bit about like what, what feeds us as teachers, what mm -hmm. lights us up as teachers. A lot of that has to do with connecting with kids and those relationships around this learning out. And I had a great conversation um, with an educator last week, and it was just about trying to help teachers reignite that fire that's yes. been so dampened by all the stress and pressure that they're on or that they're under for school, but then also just in our world right now, it's such an intense time. Right. Yeah. It, and and um, it really, and, and one of the things that the, some of the teachers I'm working with decided to do is, is instead of trying to get an entire 
week's lesson plan done and um, finished and finalized, just focusing on, you know, three days at a time, just plan from Monday to Wednesday, make sure you've got some time, you know, Wednesday or Tuesday to plan the other half of the week, but just take it in small chunks because you, you really can only do so much as a person and support your family and all the other roles and responsibilities you cover as a teacher. So, um, and I know leaders are really supporting their teachers in that as well. Well, um, Catlin, it's been so great getting to chat with you about this. I know, uh, again, you and I are kind of on the same page. This is if we could pick a structure for hybrid instruction, uh, this would not be it. Mm -hmm. But it is it is the reality for many. And so I love the ideas that you have presented and shared for today. Um, I want to remind our viewers that they can download a kind of a summary of this from Catlin in the Coach Replay Notes and Takeaways, but also check out her blog and uh, her books if you haven't yet. Um, she's got a whole course on blended learning. That's a really great one. So check, check those resources out. Um, and hopefully we'll have you back on the show another time, Catlin. All right. Thanks for having me. All right, everyone. Well, tune in next week for another episode of the Sydney Coach Replay Show. Next week, we have Kathy Renfrew back talking a little bit about the phenomena and deepening the engagement on that in our science classrooms, even online. And so uh, join us again next week. Bye, everyone. Bye.